With Grand Theft Auto 6 being between a year to two years away, it's time to look at everything that's led up to this point and how we got here. Before we get into this video, I'm not an employee or former employee of Rockstar. I've just made this video by doing research and talking to people within the industry and using publicly available information. Throughout this video, I'm going to talk a lot about Rockstar, social pressures, GTA 5, Red Dead Redemption 2 alongside GTA 6 to build a picture up about how GTA 6 has come to be and all the information we've got and how we've got it, it's important to have contextual knowledge about the atmosphere surrounding Rockstar at different stages throughout the past 10 years. When I started my channel a couple of months ago, the reason I actually started it was because I wanted to make this particular video you're watching here. If you want to support this channel so I can keep making these videos, subscribe, drop a comment, become a member, or just like this video, any support is appreciated. But by just viewing this video you're already doing a lot for me. To start painting a picture of how Grand Theft Auto 6 began its production cycle, we need to have a look at where the idea came from and look back to the roots of Grand Theft Auto in Miami. Grand Theft Auto Vice City was one of those games that a lot of people grew up with, especially throughout our formative years. After being released from prison, Tommy Vercetti, a former mobster, is sent to the sunny and dangerous Vice City. When a deal within the city goes horribly wrong, Tommy embarks on a journey across the city to reclaim what is rightfully his, no matter how many lives it takes. Grand Theft Auto Vice City was a huge play on Miami in the 1980s, taking huge inspiration from Miami Vice and Miami culture at the time. It was all about boats, flowery t-shirts, cool moustaches and the Italian mob and of course the illicit trade that happened between Florida and the South Americas. This was one of the first Grand Theft Autos I'd ever played and to this day it's left a lasting impact on a lot of the people that played it. Now for the majority of people their first entry into the Grand Theft Auto world was San Andreas and for even more people increasingly so now the first entry was actually Grand Theft Auto 5. So let's just take a little deep dive into the history and how we ended up going back to Vice City. In 2012, we had the first murmurings. On December the 13th, 2012, we got an insight into Rockstar's first visions for the game. Following the first trailer for GTA 5, a lot of fans were disappointed that Grand Theft Auto wasn't returning to Vice City. This, of course, led to magazines and news outlets directing questions towards Rockstar Games about why we were seeing a return to San Andreas as opposed to Vice City. In an interview carried out on December the 13th, 2012 by Digital Trends, Rockstar North's president at the time, Leslie Benzies, didn't seem thrilled with the idea of returning to Vice City, Miami. When asked if there's any chance Vice City might return in a future Grand Theft Auto, Benzies responded, It's always a possibility, however, Vice City, perhaps more than any other Grand Theft Auto game, was as much about the era as the setting. Miami in the 1980s is so iconic, it would feel strange to revisit the city in a different time period. Interestingly, Benzies was more open to reimagining Vice City as part of a much larger world, containing all the cities from the previous Grand Theft Auto games and letting the player travel to whichever area they wish to revisit. He said, of course, at some point we would like to have one big world containing all our cities and let the player fly between them and revisit their favourite areas, and in that context, reimagining Vice City would be very interesting. Whilst we know this isn't the case with GTA 6, it certainly is a fascinating vision, and who knows, maybe that's what they have in mind for GTA 7, as far as away that may be, or if it even ever happens. It's important to remember here that if Grand Theft Auto 5 was set in Miami, it wouldn't have worked at the time it came out. The technical limitations of the 2010s really didn't permit Rockstar being able to make a believable world out of Florida, Miami and the surrounding areas. In my opinion, setting the game in Los Santos was a perfect accompaniment to where the technology was at the time. Remember, Grand Theft Auto 5 was a game made for the PlayStation 3 era of hardware, and according to Mike York, a former developer at Rockstar that worked in Grand Theft Auto V, the game was being squeezed on that console. The amount of technology they needed at the time just to make the game run on the console without causing it to overheat or crash was revolutionary. At the time, they were using selective rendering, which basically is localized rendering of areas close to the character, making sure that any unnecessary CPU and GPU usage wasn't causing the console to thermal throttle and overheat and overcoming this was a monumental task. On October the 3rd, 2013 was the first time GTA 6 was mentioned by Leslie Benzies. The first talk of GTA 6 specifically came soon after GTA 5's release on September the 17th, 2013. When Leslie was asked about GTA 6 for the first time, he said they have 45 years worth of ideas in mind. In the interview with Develop, the former Rockstar president was asked, and when will Benzies, the Houses and Garbutt reform to talk GTA 6? Is there even a GTA 6 yet? To which Leslie responded, We've got about 45 years worth of ideas we want to do. We don't know what GTA 6 will be, but we've got some ideas. This brings us to 2014. 
In 2014, a remastered, retextured, and more refined version of GTA 5 was released to eagerly awaiting fans on PS4 and Xbox One. This allowed Rockstar to implement the graphics improvements which they originally had planned for the game, but were limited due to the PlayStation 3's limited hardware at the time. It was only a month later that the co-founder of Rockstar Games, Dan Hauser, confirmed that writing had begun for GTA 6 and he couldn't say anything else other than it was in the works. Then, something unexpected happened. Leslie Benzies took sabbatical leave from Rockstar on the 1st of September 2014 and was no longer present at Rockstar Games, but we'll get back to this later in the video. After we'd heard that GTA 6 was in early development, over the next 12 months the plans appear to have changed. With the new additions to GTA 5 Online on the advanced hardware of the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One, Rockstar realised that the online entity of Grand Theft Auto was an entire ecosystem within itself, which would be extremely important in the future. This brings us to April 2015, when GTA 5 was finally released for PC, at the time the PC gaming community was a lot smaller than it is today. You've got to remember, at that time, the gaming landscape didn't consist of the same levels of Fortnite and Minecraft popularity that we've seen over the past few years that have led to a new wave of PC gamers. Now this video is about GTA 6, so why am I talking so much about Grand Theft Auto 5? Good question. Well, during this PC and PS4 release period, Rockstar were implementing a more in-depth currency system into GTA Online. With the introduction of shark cards in December 2013, and the Megalodon shark card added in 2014 alongside the PS4 release, Rockstar quickly realised that people were buying in-game currency in their masses. And quickly, these microtransactions surpassed the revenue that the physical game sales did themselves. With the introduction of the PC port to GTA 5, Rockstar were at war with a lot of modders who were creating infinite money mods. Rockstar promptly combated this issue by banning users' accounts who were modding online forcing people to either graft on GTA Online or alternatively buy shark cards. The only other option they had would be to mod and risk getting their account banned, which a lot of people did. Now with people struggling to mod, they were buying shark cards and Rockstar had pretty much discovered their own infinite money glitch. By introducing new missions and new vehicles, Rockstar could incentivize people to buy shark cards to unlock new assets within the game. Rockstar's parent company, Take Two Interactive, are very skilled when it comes to implementing incentivized microtransactions. Take Two Interactive own a Spanish company called Social Point. This company are the people behind Dragon City and Monster Legends, and they are pioneers of the microtransaction gameplay world. So, why would Rockstar rush another entry into the Grand Theft Auto franchise? when they were doing better than they ever have previously out of GTA 5. At this point in the video, it's important to point out that Rockstar capitalising from microtransactions is not a criticism. Over the past few years, we've seen Rockstar get barraged and berated for not releasing GTA 6 on all their social media channels, but there's two key things to note here. One, why rush a game when you have almost unlimited budget to make the best game ever? Two, how can GTA 5 fans complain about Rockstar pushing microtransactions when the only reason they're doing it is because us, the fans, keep buying shark cards because Rockstar are actually giving us value out of it? It's just basic economics. At the end of the day, if Rockstar capitalising off these microtransactions was really a bad thing, people wouldn't be buying shark cards. People have voted with their wallets. With all this being said, Rockstar were in the midst of development for Red Dead Redemption 2 and GTA 6 was not a priority, but also trouble was brewing at Rockstar. Now earlier in the video, I mentioned about Leslie Benzies going on a forced sabbatical from the business. In January of 2016, it was announced that he had left the company. Benzies later claimed that he was persuaded to take the sabbatical, during which his son and several of his friends were fired from the company and his email access was suspended. When he attempted to return to work, he was ordered to leave by the office manager and says that the company made scurrilous allegations about his actions at work. This was then followed on the 12th of April of 2016, Benzi started legal action against Rockstar Games and its parent company, Take Two Interactive, claiming $150 million in unpaid royalties. This was later settled out of court for an undisclosed amount. Whilst we do not know the ins and outs of why Leslie was removed from the business, or not paid royalties if that was the case, there is no denying that this was an unfortunate turn of events. Leslie was an incredible producer, and GTA 5 would not have been as great as it was without him. Now coming into 2017, whilst Red Dead Redemption 2 was in production, the time crunch was hitting the employees of Rockstar hard, which is explained by this article published by the Mawson Group. One of the most prominent issues in the supposed toxic culture at Rockstar Games has been the pervasive culture of crunch. Crunch refers to the practice of requiring employees to work long hours, 
often unpaid or under extreme pressure, to meet tight deadlines or milestones in game development. Reports emerged about the developers working 100 hour weeks during the development of Red Dead Redemption 2, sparking controversy and drawing attention to the company's demanding work culture. This practice not only takes a toll on the physical and mental health of employees, but also contributes to a higher turnover rate within the company. And when they refer to high turnover rate, they mean that a lot of staff join the business and leave the business in quick succession, with a former employee coming out in the following statement regarding his work on GTA 4. It's been nearly a decade since I parted from Rockstar, but I can assure you that during the GTA 4 era, it was like working with a gun to your head seven days a week. Be here Saturday and Sunday too, just in case Sam or Dan, Hauser, the co-founders of Rockstar Games, come in. They want to see everyone working as hard as them. Now interestingly enough, that particular person a couple of months later made a following statement saying that this was only for a couple of months in the lead up to the game being released. This wasn't his whole time and whole employment at Rockstar Games. It's important to get that context in there. Now we can't verify the validity of these claims, but from other reports from employees at Rockstar at the time, there seemed to be a somewhat unhealthy attitude to work-life balance. Now I think it's important to remember here that when Rockstar Games started, they were the anti-corporate developer. Often going to clubs after work and indulging in the new money lifestyle that came with an indie developer developer all of a sudden getting rich from the fruits of their labour. In the early 2000s you didn't work at Rockstar because they were a huge corporate business or that you wanted a huge paycheck every month. You worked for them to create the best video games ever. Working a 100 hour week was just what communally needed to be done to get a game ready for launch. But with Rockstar now being a business with somewhere between 4 to 6 thousand employees and being overseen by Take-Two Interactive, it's impossible to avoid the elephant in the room. They are now a huge corporate entity that has to fall within the norms of corporate America. Throughout 2017 and 2018, Rockstar had an internal restructure and carried on with their efforts to get Red Dead Redemption 2 ready for release. In 2018, we saw the release of Red Dead Redemption 2. Me personally, I'd never previously played a Red Dead game, but wow, this game blew me away. The graphics, the story, the realism of NPCs, the map, everything. Rockstar took immersion to a whole new level. On the week of the release, Dan Hauser said he's thankful to be releasing Red Dead Redemption 2 and not GTA 6 this week, because the latter would be out of date within two minutes. In an extensive interview with GQ, the Rockstar co-founder discussed how his flagship franchise tone doesn't quite mesh with the current cultural climate. It's really unclear what we would even do with GTA 6, let alone how upset people would get with whatever we did. Both intense liberal progression and intense conservatism are both very militant and very angry. It's scary, but it's also strange, yet both of them seem occasionally to veer towards the absurd. It's hard to satirise for those reasons. Some of the stuff you see is straightforwardly beyond satire. It would be out of date within two minutes. Everything is changing so fast. Red Dead Redemption 2's more serious, backwards-looking approach seemed preferable to Rockstar then. However, Hauser's also keen to make clear that the new game's approach to presenting history is built somewhat around modern values. He states, it was oppressive. When you look at what was going on, it may be a work of historical fiction, but it's not a work of history. You want to allude to that stuff, but you can't do it with 100% historical accuracy. It would be deeply unpleasant. This is a time when the women's movement had begun its infancy. Women were beginning to challenge their very constrained place in society, and that gave us some interesting characters. We're not trying to tap into, he's a black man so he should speak this way, and she's an Indian woman so she should speak that way. We are trying to feel what they're like as people. Maybe that's my own idiocy, naivety or delusion about what people were fighting for about now. I know that there are some people who believe the only fiction you should do is basically your own autobiography, but I think it's really limiting and you can't tell stories. I hope that we found a sensitive way of discussing those issues. Now this is a sentiment from Dan Hauser which I can resonate with. In 2018, we were in the midst of the Me Too movement, which is something that started off as a great movement allowing people to talk about their experiences and hold perpetrators accountable. It was very empowering for a lot of people. But over time, this movement was overtaken by an extremist movement that was set to demonise any statement that was considered anything less than left propaganda, which for another entry into the Grand Theft Auto series would put Rockstar Games into the crosshairs for all the wrong reasons. So the fact that Grand Theft Auto 6 wasn't released in 2018 probably saved the business. Whilst it's understood that Grand Theft Auto 6 had been in the writing process at this point, it was very evident that things hadn't evolved too much since 2014. This brings us to 2019. In 2019, we started seeing the first real world movements from Rockstar Games. Business owners around Miami were reporting visits from Rockstar employees in the Wynwood area of Miami, stating that they would like to take photos of their stores and businesses for an upcoming title. It was around this time that the term Project Americas became well known within the GTA community, 
after first being published in an article from The No a couple of months earlier. According to Jason Schreier, an industry analyst and well-known gaming journalist, GTA 6 was originally going to be set across vast areas of both North and South America, according to Bloomberg sources, in an effort to make it the biggest entry in the series to date, which ties into Miami's illicit product trade throughout history with South America. But it was not to be. Later in 2019, Dan Hauser, the co-founder of Rockstar Games, left the business, leaving only Sam Hauser in charge. Whilst we don't know his exact reasons for leaving, it's generally accepted by the GTA community that this could be linked to the fact he wanted new challenges, and making a GTA game in a world that seemed offended by everything may not have aligned with his vision for the next Grand Theft Auto entry. Heading into 2020, with the impact of the pandemic and the transition brought up by the departure of Dan Hauser, all contributed to the reasons why Grand Theft Auto 6 had been in the works for so long. With development having started sometime in 2014, at this point it's now been six years since the initial concepts were drafted up. With the world inaccessible, Rockstar had to take stock of what they had to keep the business going but the pandemic brought along an unexpected change within the gaming industry. With people stuck at home, the gaming industry exploded. Rockstar knew that in order to generate money from GTA 5, they needed to get it into the hands of as many people as possible. Rockstar struck a deal with Epic Games, where the game was free to play until May 2020 from the Epic Games store. This got a whole new generation hooked on the seven year old game that had impacted the generation before it. And it got old players re-enticed with the game. And this of course encouraged more players to buy shark cards and make microtransactions in GTA Online. It was at this point that Grand Theft Auto Online became entirely separate from GTA 5. Yep, you don't need GTA 5 to play GTA Online, you can purchase it separately. On April the 15th 2020, Kotaku released the first substantial report for the next Grand Theft Auto. The report mainly focused on the studio's workplace culture and revealed interesting details about the next game. Kotaku claimed that the game was in early development and would start as a moderately sized release, but still large by Rockstar standards, this moderate launch would be expanded upon with plenty of updates over time, presumably with DLC. The influx of new GT Online players and the buzz from the Kotaku report meant that throughout the pandemic, Rockstar didn't just survive, they thrived. It also gave them significant revenue to put back into the development of Grand Theft Auto 6, with GT Online making Rockstar Games about $2.5 million a day. But it's worth noting here that Rockstar isn't a cheap business to run. With around 4 to 6,000 employees and an average salary of $40,000 a year, a quarter of their earnings go out in salaries alone, never mind the additional costs of running a business and the taxes involved. Now 2021. 2021 was surprisingly quite a quiet year for GTA news. With Rockstar being focused on GTA 6 and GTA Online, there wasn't much news in the industry from them. But in 2022, that changed. On Friday the 4th of February 2022, Rockstar confirms development. In an announcement that took the internet by storm, Rockstar kicked off 2022 with a confirmation that active development for the next entry into the Grand Theft Auto series is well underway. Whilst they didn't explicitly say Grand Theft Auto 6, this was the first time Rockstar publicly as a business acknowledged the GTA game. This was followed by general industry buzz in July of 2022. Five months after Rockstar's first confirmation of the game, Bloomberg released arguably the most extensive report. This report claimed that the game would take place in Miami, corroborated by leaks soon after. More on that shortly. With more locations being added, Bloomberg also claimed that GTA 6 would feature a Bonnie and Clyde inspired duo, with the series' first female protagonist and male protagonist, also corroborated by the leaks that came later. Now, all of this was followed by the September the 18th, 2022 massive leak. In what's considered one of the most significant data breaches ever, over 90 pre-alpha GTA 6 gameplay videos were leaked in September 2022. These leaks confirm it will be set in modern day Miami and the surrounding areas. Two protagonists were also revealed, a Latina woman named Lucia and a man named Jason, seemingly confirming Bloomberg's report just a few months prior. At the time, the hacker was a 17 year old named Arian Curtage, part of the Lapsus hacking group, which consisted of hackers from all over the world consisting of, but not limited to, the UK and Brazil. Curtage was on bail and being kept in a hotel without access to the internet after he'd been arrested for hacking EE and British Telecoms, a tech giant in the UK. He gained access to their user data and attempted to extort money out of the business or else he threatened to leak the data, slash sell it to the highest bidder. Whilst Arian Curtage was being held in the hotel, he walked to a nearby retail park and bought an Amazon Fire Stick 
a keyboard and a mouse from a local shop. He then went back to the hotel, plugged it into the back of his smart TV in the hotel room and remotely connected to his PC at home, where he used the hotel's TV as a portal back to his home computer. From here, he conducted a phishing scam, sending spoof emails to Rockstar employees pretending to be an automated password reset email, which unfortunately an unknown amount of Rockstar employees fell for. Now these emails encourage Rockstar employees to change the email addresses for Slack, which is a corporate messaging platform used by a large number of businesses, including Rockstar. After the employees had entered their passwords to reset their passwords, Kurtage logged into their Slack channels and downloaded all of the footage from the chats, which showed GTA 6 in development. But he also managed to download the source code from GTA 5, which is the source code for the Rockstar Advanced Game Engine, which is the very fabric in which GTA 5 was built on. The footage itself also showcased a number of missions, world events, and even Python script within GTA 6. Ari and Kurtage then left a message in the Slack channel demanding contact from Rockstar and for them to pay him or he would leak the footage. With this being escalated internally with inside Rockstar, and Rockstar not actually responding back to Kurtage, he leaked the clips on the GTA forums under the name Teapot Uber Hacker, a name derived from one of his previous hacks being the company Uber. The following day, Rockstar issued a statement confirming that early development footage was leaked, and as disappointing as it was, the studio didn't expect any long-term delay. But this wasn't the end of the trouble that Arian and Kurtage would cause Rockstar, and we will revisit Kurtage shortly. Now this brings us to May 2023. During Take Two's quarter four 2023 earnings call on May the 17th, the company announced expectations of setting new standards for our industry and over 8 billion in net bookings in fiscal 25 due to the strength of its upcoming release schedule. At the point of this going live, Take Two Interactive's turnover was around about four to five billion a year. So nearly doubling the turnover really only meant one release title. Realistically, there's only one game that can achieve that sort of money, and that's Grand Theft Auto 6. Since Take Two's fiscal year takes place from April to March, it's safe to assume that GTA 6 will be released between April 24 and April 25, based on Take Two's projections. A full 2024 or early 2025 release seemed most likely at the time. A number of people are currently speculating a September 2025 release, but the most likely release date at present is April 2025, to fit within the projected fiscal year predictions from Rockstar's parent company. This would also align with the month in which Grand Theft Auto 4 was released. On November the 7th, 2023, we got our first trailer confirmation for early December. Bloomberg released a report claiming the game would be announced that week, with the first trailer coming in December. The following day, on the bottom of an X slash Twitter thread, in classic Rockstar subtleness, the studio announced the game's debut trailer is set for early December, coinciding with the 25th anniversary. The internet went wild. Well, I know I did anyway. <laughs> Heading into December, Rockstar archived all of their posts on Instagram, leaving just one post remaining. A post announcing that Trailer 1 would debut on YouTube on the 5th of December 2023 at 9am Eastern Time. Within 24 hours, this post had reached 4 million likes and to date, it's nearly at 7 million likes. It's one of the most liked gaming posts of all time. But with hype being at an all time high, it was only a matter of time until things started going exponentially wrong. Now I need to give you all a little bit of context here. When videos are uploaded to YouTube, they carry information on YouTube servers. For the most part, this is just metadata. But this metadata also includes a low resolution video, which acts as a processing file for the video. On the 4th of December at 11 p.m. UK time, a video surfaced online of a 360p resolution video with a Bitcoin logo over the top of it. This was the GTA 6 trailer leaked by data miners. So Rockstar had to make a decision. They had two options. One, let the world see an awful low resolution version of the trailer and have that as the trailer that people remember. Or two, make the full 4K high resolution trailer public. They chose the latter and made a post on Twitter saying, our trailer has leaked, so please watch the real thing on YouTube. The trailer was well received by everyone, but a number of developers were understandably extremely upset that they couldn't enjoy the trailer with everyone at the same time. A lot of Rockstar employees had the expectation that they'd go into work at 9am the following day, sit with all their colleagues and watch the trailer for the first time together. Obviously, this isn't what happened. This brings us to the last week or so of information. Remember Arian Kurtage, the person that hacked Rockstar via Slack Messenger? Well, a week ago, at 18 years old, 
He was sentenced and charged to be indefinitely held at a hospital due to his mental state being in question. During the legal proceedings, he had had violent outbursts towards correctional staff. He also expressed that if he was let off the charges, he would immediately go back to hacking. Well, it turns out the code that he had acquired during his hacking escapade, he'd actually sold that for $4,000 and the person he had sold them to had accidentally leaked the source code on Christmas Eve. So whilst Rockstar's employees had worked so hard for the past couple of years and had a couple of days off for Christmas, then had to deal with the source code of their biggest money earner, being GTA 5, being leaked. And on the same day, we got the information that Manny Perez is the actor that's playing the character of Lucia. I've done four deep dives on every single topic that's been covered in this video, and you can see that on my channel. It's definitely been a busy week for GTA 6 leaks for sure. So over the past 10 years, Rockstar have been no strangers to provocation, stress and turmoil that I'm sure has tested everyone within their business. But you can't make diamonds without pressure. Thank you for watching this video. And if you want to support my channel, please consider becoming a member. I don't want to do the whole woe is me troubled YouTuber thing. <laughs> But being a gaming channel with only 3,600 subscribers, it's increasingly hard to spend days at a time on videos when YouTube advertising revenue for gaming channels just isn't exactly the best. With an average earning of $4 to $6 per video, any support is appreciated to help me to be able to spend more time creating these sorts of videos. But if you're not in a position to become a member at this moment in time, just liking, subscribing, commenting, watching the videos, just engaging in general is honestly more than enough support and I can't be grateful enough for all of you watching my videos. A few months ago no one knew who I was and now I have a great community of people on Discord that have helped me make videos and given me feedback. I really do appreciate all of you. Thank you all for watching today's video and I'll see you in the next one.